Oh, I am? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for being here. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to update folks on what we're doing uh, for the 2010 Census. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our efforts as of late uh, to reflect what we perceive was an undercount of the 2000 Census uh, that was done here in the city and county of San Francisco. About two years ago, uh, through our Communities of Opportunity, we hired a firm to do what we called a drill down where we went throughout the diverse neighborhoods of the city and county of San Francisco. We went into single room occupancy hotels. We went into the homeless shelters. We got deep into the community and public housing, et cetera. And we started matching some more specific data, uh, matching cable bills, matching phone bills, matching electrical bills, cross-referencing them uh, with all kinds of other data. And we estimated that our undercount from the 2000 census was about 100,000 individuals. Uh, this is a report that, by the way, is available available online that is the most comprehensive and detailed the city has ever undertaken. As a consequence, we used that report to submit an application appealing our census uh, number uh, and were, was very pleased that we were successful. Uh, partially, not 100%. I was giving uh, these guys a hard time. Uh, it would have been nice to get the full 100 plus thousand, uh, but the census data was amended through our appeal. I think we became one of the few cities in California, maybe the only one that even appealed, let alone was successful uh, in our appeal uh, with the Census Bureau. What happens, and they can talk a little bit about this, is the numbers nationally don't change. They have to take from other communities, other states. Typically, states will appeal their census data, but only a few cities have appealed their census data. Uh, we were successful, and we are quite appreciative because this matters. Because at the end of the day, this is about funding. This is about federal dollars, and it's about state dollars. It's about per capita dollars. It's about formula dollars when it comes to the American Recovery Act. These, ma these dollars matter. These numbers matter in relationship to those dollars. Uh, give you a sense, $255 million a year, the controller's estimate of federal funding comes in the city and county of San Francisco. That's what's at stake. So if, for example, in the 2010 census, we say we have no population, we're going to leave $255 million um, sitting there at the federal government. Uh, if we are successful counting everybody, we're obviously going to be able to draw down uh, a lion's share of those dollars. So that's what we're eligible for in terms of a high end, Adrian, I guess is the way you are analyzing uh, that number. We believe that because of that undercount in 2000, that over the last decade, about $300 million, in fact, it was about $290 million, we're rounding up, uh, million dollars was left on the table that should have come to the city and county of San Francisco. That was our failure to account accurately the number of people living in this city. Uh, and we believe that very confidently is an accurate number. So this is a big deal. If you're here and you're wondering why you're here uh, and what's a big thing about this, uh, and doesn't this take care of itself and, you know, it's good to know how many people exist in a community, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, and at a time of economic stress, uh, I don't know many bigger deals because these are dollars that we are due uh, as Americans uh, that would otherwise go someplace else if we weren't aggressive in terms of our count. So that's the purpose. Second, we know the people that are uncounted. They tend to be minorities, tend to be people of color. And they tend to be, again, in those conditions and environment that I referenced in these SROs, uh, in uh, communities uh, where we just do a cursory pass by. And so that's why today we're announcing this new committee that we have formed, uh, folks you see behind me, uh, Supervisor Campos, Supervisor Dufty that are here. I and Supervisor Carmen Chu uh, that are here all participating in this effort to make sure that we do not undercount uh, again and certainly not in 2010. So we're going to do this right. Uh, and we've got a remarkably diverse group of people that are going to make sure that we're reaching out uh, in every community in our city. And we're doing a lot more than we're expected to do. We're not going to do the minimum amount of work, quite the contrary. Uh, we're going to do our own supplemental marketing. We're going to do our own supplemental outreach. The Census Bureau uh, is doing a better job than ever, I would argue, and I'm very appreciative the new administration in Washington, D.C. understands the value and importance of an accurate 
account. It sometimes gets caught up in politics. I'll leave that to someone else to describe why. It's for the life of me, I don't understand why, uh, as citizens, uh, that we should be considered political uh, in terms of reaching out and identifying uh, an accurate number of, uh, of citizens and where they live. Uh, but this, nonetheless, does get caught up in a bit of politics. And we want to make sure that if that inclination rears its head again, that we're uh, doing our best uh, to make sure that we offset that. Phil Ting is another person that is committed to trying to offset uh, that inclination as well. So that's the group you see behind me. I also submitted an executive order uh, to my departments uh, today that set forth the criteria for making sure that our departments are doing everything, every city department is doing everything in its power to support and assist uh, this new committee that has been formed. We have a point person in every department that will be responsible supporting and staffing uh, this committee uh, so that we again have an accurate count. Uh, we have the support of our regional administrator uh, and we are very blessed to have three members uh, from the Census uh, Bureau here today and they'll talk in a moment in greater detail and specificity about how uh, they can support our efforts and how we can most importantly support their efforts uh, to make sure this count is accurate. Um, final uh, couple points. There is a major issue that was underscored yesterday by the California Supreme Court. And that issue uh, was underscored by the California Supreme Court's adjudication that the 18,000 same-sex couples that were legally married, that their marriage licenses remain valid. Why does that matter? Well, right now, the Census Bureau, and again, not a critique, but an observation, uh, is going to go out and knock on doors. We're going to go out and knock on doors with them, fill out forms, and it says married or unmarried. And if you're a same-sex couple, and there are 18,000 of them in California alone, we say we're married. They may check that box, but when it comes back to analyzing the data, those are not married households because the Federal Bureau does not recognize same-sex couples as married. So you'll have thousands of kids in San Francisco, we estimate close to 13,000 children are living in same-sex couple households that will be children with unwed parents. I think that matters. I think that's wrong and we're going to fight it. Now I know these guys may not be appreciative to hear that, um, but I just think it's fundamentally wrong in a society where people legally are advanced their rights in Iowa and Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts and we hope soon in other states as married couples they should be considered married for obvious and self-evident reason. And so we're going to do everything in our power to fight uh, for this change. It's not easy. We arguably are late in the game, and I understand some of the bureaucratic limitations. Mayor Bloomberg in New York uh, and their city council uh, president, Captain Quinn, or Kevin Quinn, or Christine, Christine Quinn, uh, President Quinn, um, has uh, been forceful on this uh, out here. We are doing the same. Supervisor Dufty uh, carried uh, a resolution. Uh, I think co-sponsored by everyone but three members of the board. I don't know what were, maybe, I hope they were absent for not supporting <laughs> it, but the notably absent on the, on the uh, co-sponsorship. Um, and uh, we've written letters and we'll write letters and we'll continue to advocate on this, I think, very important point. If the idea is everyone counts, then let's count everyone accurately. And everyone means everyone. And uh, it means those same-sex couples, whether you support same-sex uh, relationships or you're opposed to them, uh, the fact is people legally have been married in this country. And if they've been legally married under our laws, they should be legally counted under our procedures. Uh, and so that's another advocacy that I wanted to leave you with. That's also part of our executive order uh, and our outreach efforts. With that, uh, I'm very pleased that we appointed Adrian Hahn to lead this effort. Uh, she's been working uh, closely with uh, the assessor and uh, with supervisors, and she has uh, two co-chairs of this effort that she'll introduce to you uh, that have reached out to the people you see present, uh, and we have a specific strategy that she will unveil in terms of how we're going to go about doing what it is we're responsible for doing uh, in a responsible manner. Adrian. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and to the members of our 
Complete Count Committee, I'd like to start by introducing them. Uh, we are about to embark on the most important civic engagement effort for the city in the last 10 years. I see another member of our uh, committee, so I'm gonna ask her to step forward. And uh, first of all, I'd like to start by introducing the co-chairs. I believe one of the co-chairs is not here today, Commissioner Andrea Shorter, uh, but the other co-chair is here, Annie Chung from uh, President and CEO of Self Help for the Elderly. If you could just wave as I call your name, and then we'll hear from uh, the speaker shortly. Sherilyn Adams, Executive Director of the Larkin Street Youth Services. Rosario Anaya, Executive Director of Mission Language Vocational Schools. Elmi Bermejo, Interim Executive Director of Latino Issues Forum. Michael Casey, President of Unite Here Local 2. Annie Chung, I previously mentioned. Jamal Dajani, Director of Link TV. Cheryl Davis, Executive Director of Mo Magic. John Eller, Director of Acorn San Francisco. Don Falk, Executive Director of the Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation. Eileen Hernandez, Founder of the California Women's Agenda and Chair of the African American Out Migration Task Force. Jim Lazarus, Senior VP, San Francisco Chamber of Commerce. Jan Masaoka, director and editor-in-chief of Blue Avocado, and Jan is the former executive director and CEO of Compass Point. Angus McCarthy, uh, the Immigrant Rights Commission. Toye Moses, the Southeast Facility Board executive director and also a member of the Immigrant Rights Commission. Philip Wynn, executive director of the Southeast Asian Community Center here in San Francisco. Vincent Pan, uh, Commissioner on the Police Commission and also Executive Director of Chinese for Affirmative Action. Michael Pappas, Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council. Mario Paz, Executive Director of Good Samaritan Family Resource Center. Ana Perez, Executive Director of Kerson. Rebecca Rolfe, Executive Director of the LBGT Community Center, San Francisco. Rosabella Safant, Elections Commissioner and also Associate Director of the Mission Economic Development Agency. Andrea Shorter, our other co-chair, who is President of the Commission on the Status of Women. Bernadette C., Executive Director of the Filipino American Development Foundation in SOMA. Kent Wu, Executive Director of Nikos Chinese Health Coalition. And Mariposa Tafete, who is president of the Petrero Terrace Residential Council. Uh, these are a distinguished group of community and civic leaders. I am so thrilled to be given the opportunity to work with this incredible group. The committee, of course, will play a critical role in helping the city to develop strategic approaches to ensuring an accurate, complete, and inclusive count during the 2010 census. Uh, we have an enormous task before us. We have to make sure that about 850,000 people, that's every man, woman, and child in San Francisco, are counted in the 2010 census. Moreover, we have to make sure that the more than 100,000 people who were left out of the 2000 census are counted and that they matter. Um, our job is to partner with the U.S. Census Bureau, and I'll be introducing the officials from, from them um, in a minute, and the community, and, um, and the entire city, to make sure that every San Francisco resident knows exactly what to do on April 1st when they receive their census form. Uh, that is, fill out the form, send it back, or go to a community center to get help in filling it out. We have come a long way since 1790 when the first census asked just six questions. I'm going to read those questions to you. The name of the head of the household, the number of free white males older than 16, the number of free white males younger than 16, the number of free white females, and the total number of other free persons. The last question was the total number of slaves. In 2010, we have an incredible opportunity to advocate for change, for inclusion, and for equality in this and future federal surveys. Each and every person matters, uh, not just to us, but to the nation and to the world. Participating in the census is the very first step in civic engagement and a democratic society. Being counted in the census means you matter, and you absolutely matter to us. With that, I'm going to introduce Annie Chung, the co-chair of the Complete Count Committee. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Mr. Mayor, Adrian, I think you've brought all of us here today to make one pledge to you, and that is to work very, very hard to make sure that every man, woman, child, senior, and family is counted in San Francisco during the next census count. I think. Adrian's panel that's here assembled here today underscores the fact that funding for our communities is very important to keep the elderly services, the childcare, the schools, everything that we do in the community, uh, somebody have to pay for it. And unfortunately, by undercounting the San Francisco population, you are cutting out a lot of valuable uh, dollars for our community. So for this upcoming census count, I think all of the committee uh, pledge our support with you, Adrian and Mr. Mayor and the census uh, officers here, that we will roll up our sleeves and go out to the community with you because if you bring one of us along, it's more likely uh, that our community will open the doors and fill out the forms. Because uh, having done a little bit work recently on the digital TV transition, we found that more than 80,000 residents in San Francisco lives in single room dwellings, what Mayor referred to earlier as SROs, and these are not recognized as official addresses uh, by our federal government. And these residents will not be able to get their converter boxes because of that fact. So I urge you to um, work with us, work with each one of the committees, so when the census workers go out and knock on the doors that we are ready for them and we will do a very, very accurate count. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annie. We cannot do this without the community's help, but we absolutely can't do this without a close partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two leads from the Census Bureau. They're here today with their teams, Ralph Lee, the Regional Director of the U.S. Census Bureau, and Mike Burns, the Associate Director. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I want to thank Mayor Newsom for issuing this executive order in support of the complete county of San for San Francisco. It is really through these partnerships with local governments, with cities, and organizations that we will have a complete count. Um, we are looking forward to working with Adrian and her staff um, in making sure that we get a complete and accurate count for San Francisco. We have hired a very diverse and staff for uh, the Bay Area, and in particular um, for San Francisco. Um, we are actively engaged in reaching out to all of the communities to get a complete and accurate count. I'd like to introduce my deputy, uh, Mike Burns. Well, good morning. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor and also Adrian Pond, and also the complete count committee that we have around us here. It is only through a complete count committee working closely with the Census Bureau that we are going to be able to get an accurate count of San Francisco. Each census we have complete count committees and just looking around the room here I'm very impressed with the staff that will be working with us. The three main things we have to get out to all San Franciscans is that number one the census is easy it's only 10 questions to answer. Second it's safe Every census employee takes an oath of confidentiality. And that third thing that Mayor Newsom mentioned is the funding aspect. There is so much that comes back to census and also to the city of San Francisco based upon those census numbers. And that's why it's so important to ensure that San Francisco gets its accurate piece of the pie. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody here in the room. And uh, also, we are looking very, uh, very earnestly to working very closely with you. So again, thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Burns, B-U-R-N-S. Okay, those of, who, uh, those of you who were here yesterday know that there are some important issues of equity to the city and county of San Francisco. I'd like to introduce two individuals who have been leaders in that movement. Rebecca Rolfe, the Executive Director at LBGT Community Center in San Francisco, and Supervisor Bevan Duffy. Thank you. 
My name is Rebecca Rolf, and I'm the Executive Director of the San Francisco LGBT Community Center. And we're really honored to be a part of this committee, um, and we really want to thank uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom and the Board of Supervisors for their leadership in not only ensuring that we get a complete count of every San Francisco resident, but also that we recognize the same-sex relationships and the LGBT community here, which is um, generally significantly undercounted, and as uh, Mayor Newsom uh, mentioned, the uh, same-sex marriages are not recognized by the U.S. Census. So we know that uh, LGBT people and the LGBT community contribute significantly to the economic and social and cultural vitality of San Francisco, as do other undercounted communities, communities of color, immigrant communities. Um, it's really important, I think, to look at an accurate reflection of who lives in San Francisco, so that as we look at how resources are allocated, we can make sure that there's a fair and equitable allocation to San Francisco and a recognition of the role that our, our many and vibrant um, and diverse communities play in the, in the health and vitality of San Francisco. So we really are pleased and honored to be a part of this committee, and we look forward to working with the fellow committee members um, and the Board of Supervisors and the Mayor and the U.S. Census Bureau to make sure that we get a, an accurate count of who's in San Francisco um, and uh, what our families particularly look like. Now you know that we are blessed in San Francisco to have the leadership of Mayor Newsom. Uh, we are also equally blessed to have the leadership of our elected officials. I'd like to introduce three of our supervisors and our assessor, uh, Phil Ting, uh, who have really played an important role in the early stages of getting the census effort up and uh, moving in San Francisco. So that's Supervisors Chu, Supervisor Campos, and I guess Supervisor Dufty is not going to speak today, and Assessor Ting. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming here. I just want to speak on behalf of the Board of Supervisors that I'm sure that every single one of us really want to emphasize how important it is to participate in the census and to get different communities involved and be counted. Not only does it make sure that we, every single voice is counted, but it makes sure that we have the funding that is needed to run our city. Just coming from a different perspective, I remember in 1999, leading up to the 2000 census, I worked actually from the other side, from the nonprofit organization side, to try to help get the word out in the communities about how important it is and to make sure that people were aware of how safe the process was. And I just want to underscore that that's going to be very, very important in this year's effort to make sure that all of our nonprofit community uh, leaders who we see here today uh, really do play an important role with us. So I thank the Census Bureau. I thank all of our nonprofit leaders uh, and, of course, our city leaders for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, final point, and we'll get to questions. Um, there's also a job opportunity here. Right, Phil? You hire people. And we estimate anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 people just here alone that you will employ for these efforts. If I'm listening, watching at home on local cable channel 26, a late night replay, 3 in the morning, and I've had a difficult time getting a job, who do I call if this is something I'm interested in and would uh, support? We do have a toll-free number. It's 1-866-866. I'm sorry. Let's start this again. 1-866-861-2010. That's our, our, our toll-free line. It will get, then get routed to the proper office um, um, here in the Bay Area. And uh, subject to uh, the appropriations process, 311 will, of course, be available to direct people appropriately. And that's exactly why we have a 311 call center, uh, is for things like this. So you can call 311, and they'll direct you uh, to uh, the Census uh, Bureau and that information. With that, happy to answer any questions. Anyone here, I'm sure, would be happy to answer any questions as well. That is two much silence. No, no questions on this topic. There you go, Rob. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, I hardly yeah. have <laughs> 15 years. Uh, anyone else, any qu questions on this topic so we can let folks go? Uh, what kind of uh, outreach does the census already provide and what will San Francisco be providing in addition to it? <laughs> 
We have a partnership program that works very, very closely with grassroots organization here in San Francisco. What we have found out in previous census is that when we make sure that we hire people from the neighborhood to actually enumerate the neighborhood, we are matching the language and culture of that neighborhood, and the doors open up to us. Uh, I grew up in an immigrant neighborhood myself in Philadelphia, and I know I could get better response when I knock on that door when I switch into Italian versus if I say it in English. So it's very, very important that we match that culture and language in every part of San Francisco. Now, the only way we can do that is mass uh, advertising about our jobs, but more importantly, working through the Complete Count Committee to ensure that we are getting the word out to the different neighborhoods that we do have jobs and we don't want to hire people to our different positions. Most importantly, though, was that we have a partnership program and the partnership staff, and if uh, you can raise your hands in the, in the audience here, you have Leah Bolden in the back here, you have Sonny Lee, you have Ricardo, you have Dang, who used to work for the city here, and also uh, Dave Shaperger, just to name uh, just a few people in the audience here that are part of our partnership program and will work very closely with the Complete Count Committee. We're looking very forward uh, to working uh, with the Complete Count Committee and to make sure that we get that accurate count so that when people get that message, when they see that new school going up, you have to think about the census. When you see that new Meals on Wheels going down the street, you have to think about the census. It's because of that funding that comes back to this community, it is so important, as the mayor was saying, that we get that accurate count. So again, um, I want to thank everybody here and also the Complete Count Committee. And, uh, oh, Kelly. No, I was just going to say, I'm a stickler for names and spelling, so I wanted Adrian to come to the mic and do All that. Right. Okay. Want to make sure that, you know, we get it Thank correct. Thank you for asking. A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Last name is P-O-N. I did not participate in the script spelling beat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Supervisor Campos, you wanted to underscore one final point. Uh, and then we'll just just one quick point. Uh, I think it's really important that we reach out to the communities that historically have been undercounted. I think that we have to uh, provide a lot, of inf a lot of education, and I know that within the Latino community and other communities, uh, immigrant communities in particular, there is a fear that perhaps some of the information will not be confidential, and I think that we just need to make sure that people understand that there is nothing to lose by participating in the census, that that information will not be shared with any outside agency and I know that uh, for many undocumented people in particular, that's a real concern. And so I, I'm very appreciative of the fact that the city is committed. Uh, I, I want to thank the mayor for making this a priority. And I do, as a gay man, do challenge the census to make sure that the, the marriages of the 18,000 people in California are properly uh, and duly recognized by the census. I think that it's not just the practical implications, but also the symbolism of that. So hopefully you'll do the right thing. Thank you. To the extent it's in their power, I, I know this has to go up the political chain. Uh, any final questions? And then we'll move to the next topic. Just curious about the history. Why is that uh, 2000 is undercounted? A lot of these people. Well, we, just didn't, we didn't do an adequate amount of outreach, candidly. Uh, we did a, I, look, a spirited job. I thought there was uh, a lot of hard work. But we didn't do enough. Bottom line, no reason. Look forward, not look backwards. We learned some lessons. That was the idea of the drill down. And candidly, we hired this independent outside group to help us identify the areas where we were undercounting. And so that actually gives us the framework to which now we are able to uh, dig deep into diverse communities. The tenderloin was disproportionately undercounted. Um, we also identified in the Western Edition uh, a big undercount. Uh, and you, of course, I think all of us recognize the uh, opportunities, as Adrian mentioned, to really reach in and, and Annie uh, into the single room occupancy hotels throughout the city, including Chinatown uh, and elsewhere, because that is just a glaring example of where we're going to see uh, some big gaps unless we address that forthrightly. But again, the whole idea here is to supplement uh, in Italian. I, it's good that you, I love that you speak Italian. Uh, they're, they're, I'm not sure that's going to be as necessary as Mandarin, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, so we've got, the, the whole key is, and remember, this is a city where 30, what is it, 
of San Franciscans um, are immigrants. Uh, Forty-six percent of the languages we speak at home uh, are not English. Forty, almost half the languages people speak back at home are a different language than uh, English. So this is a remarkably diverse community. And if you do go to someone's door and you're from the government, my gosh, people are running out the back door in some cases. So uh, the idea is to uh, put a face of familiarity uh, a member of the community, someone you trust, someone you're aware of, uh, introduce yourself and remind people of what Supervisor Campos and others are reminding and member Senate, representatives from Census Bureau that this is absolutely unequivocally confidential. Uh, and we have, in addition to that, our own rules and regulations in terms of uh, our accountability to be even more confidential uh, than even the federal regulations and rules. And I think that was also underscored by Supervisor Campos. Our sanctuary policies, et cetera, uh, will not be pierced uh, by our efforts here as well. So great. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I'll stay for all of you uh, and uh, let you guys go before you pass out. It's getting warm, Steve. Thanks, guys. Let me just try to get to uh, answer these questions. Uh, assuming there was, Rob. <laughs> okay, can I, a couple of things on gay marriage. Um, so question one, how do you, because you've been traveling around a lot in this state, how do you think uh, the, the, uh, the, the pro-gay marriage side can s sell this better in a campaign next time than last time? Yeah, I think we, we just have to put a human face on this issue. We have to talk to our family first and to our friends and neighbors, community leaders, and we have to, uh, we have to soften the rhetoric a bit uh, that good people, truly good people, and I say this and I remind people, members of my own family, people I care deeply about, disagree with me on this issue. And so when we say good people, truly members of our own family disagree with us that are otherwise very progressive, that believe in equality, but just don't believe in the word marriage, that believe in civil unions, but not the word marriage. And those are the people I think we have to reach out to first. Uh, and we have to remind people that members of the LGBT community are our nurses, our doctors, our police officers, our firefighters, there are cameramen and women, there are newscasters, they're members of our community. Uh, they're real people and they have friends and family themselves. These are our sons and daughters, uh, LGBT community leaders and members. And so that's I think the most important thing to do, humanize the issue by putting a human face on discrimination. Can you follow up, please? So how do you, how do you think, is that right? Is, uh, how do you think um, it'll affect, you know, the governor's, this, it all affects the governor's uh, you race? Well, you'll do a number of reports on that, and I'll leave it to your more objective minds. Nothing's changed from the first time you guys asked me that question, and the 15th time, and the 23rd time. Um, over the course of the last year and a half, uh, nothing's changed. I think people know my position, they know where I stand, they know what I care about, they know what I'll fight for. Uh, I'm not putting my finger in the wind uh, when it comes to issues of equality. Those are things to me that are sacrosanct. Uh, and I'd rather lose an election with my head held high, standing on a principle, than winning an election with my head down low. Uh, and so I'm going to continue to fight for what I believe in. It's not even in the top 20. I mean, again, many of you have followed me in these town halls in Fresno, Placer County. I've been all over the state. It's just, it comes up after 23 other issues come up, even for members of the LGBT community. I think, well, what about my job? Uh, so this issue is not the issue it was in November. I think the proponents of Prop 8 are, I think, are, I don't want to say misleading because uh, that wouldn't be fair. I think they're a little too hopeful that the conditions in the world that existed last year will exist next year. I don't think it will. Uh, the economy, jobs, issues uh, associated with health and the environment uh, are bigger issues. Uh, and uh, I think people's energy and intensity uh, on this issue, uh, those that were supportive of Prop 8, uh, I don't think it will be uh, that intense next year. I think the advocates will be intense. But I don't think their supporters from out of state are going to run and write big checks next year when they don't have much left in the bank account this year. Uh, and so I think the dynamics have changed dramatically uh, from last year. And uh, I think that's why it's wise to go forward next year. So what do you consider your role um, other than 
you know, talking to your friends and family, uh, are I'm you going to be as out front of, as I'm you not, were before, I, or do you think it's... Some argued I wasn't out front at all, I mean, I, in, in the last campaign. The, remember, and I was talking to Heather about this yesterday, the, the No on 8 campaign went to great lengths not to use politicians. Remember that. The Yes on 8 campaign did. The No on ca 8 campaign did not. And so there was some intentionality behind that. Uh, there was a great commercial that Senator Feinstein did for the No on 8 campaign that wasn't run until the end that underscores the fact they didn't want politicians to be front and center. Um, I thought that was a good strategy. In some respects, I think uh, Senator Feinstein uh, could have played a much more formidable role in terms of her advocacy against uh, Proposition 8, uh, and she offered that. But that being said, uh, that's the past. And I think in the future, it's wise to keep politicians, to the extent we can, out of the equation as much as we can. Because again, if my argument is this is about human beings and putting a human face, it's about every one of us doing that work uh, day in, day out. And that's a better strategy than paid media or political endorsements. Uh, this one is about going into your churches. Uh, this is one about going into your neighborhood and community centers uh, and saying, hey, you know, do you know that my uncle is gay? And his life has been devastated by what's happened in the last few months. And I want you to know he's a really remarkable person. And I want to introduce you to him. And I want you to hear from him why this matters. And you start doing that. And people say, you know what, I believe in equality. I, I always supported someone like Bob, but I didn't understand why this was so important to him. And now, you know what, I'm going to change my point of view. Or I'm going to as assess this a little differently. I, that's how you win a campaign. It's very close. It's a very close. So how do you win these kinds of races in a close election? I think it's, that's the way you do it. It's not money in big campaign ads. It's about real people organizing. And that's what's happening. You know, the no on eight... I, I almost, you know, the day after the election, after we lost, I sort of looked around and said, well, where were all these people the day before? I mean, across this country. Where were they? I don't think people realized what's at stake. I don't even think people realize that it was already legal to have same-sex marriages in California when they voted. I don't think a lot of people understood that. We are all insiders. We, we understood that. A lot of other folks didn't even understand that, that this became the first state in U.S. history to use the Constitution to strip people's rights away. Uh, I don't think people still to this day realize. What do you think about this uh, court case now going be, uh, into U.S. District Court? Well, I, I'm uh, very familiar with the boys' law firm, um, very familiar, friends that work there. It's one of the most um, uh, powerful law firms in the world, not just the United States. This is a big deal that they're going to enter into the federal courts. And, uh, and I appreciate and, uh, and admire their willingness to take this on. It's going to take years to work its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. But we've always said at the end of the day, just like the history of all rights movements, it also lands up in the U.S. Supreme Court, as the interracial marriage debate did in 1967. You can't have a patchwork of 30 states that support same-sex marriage, 20 states that don't uh, in this country those things are ultimately addressed by the Supreme Court. And by the way, it's almost literally the number of states, 16 denied interracial marriage in 1967, and then the Supreme Court overturned it. It wasn't because we put it to a vote or referendum. If we did, those 16 states, many of them would not have interracial marriage today. I, it's really important to remind people that uh, the rights of minorities have not been advanced by the majority of people in most cases. Not in every case, but most cases it's been advanced by the courts protecting people's constitutional rights uh, in a constitutional democracy. And I want to underscore we're a constitutional democracy. Uh, that being said, the peril of what happened yesterday and what happened last year with Prop 8 is how easy it is to change the Constitution. So don't change a law when you can change the Constitution. If you change the Constitution, you don't have to worry about the courts overturning your law. If it takes just as many votes and just as much energy and no one even realizes the difference when they're voting, I don't think most people understood they changed the Constitution. I think they were just voting to affirm a position, uh, a law, not a Constitution. And that's why this case was very limited. Remember, the, the case yesterday was just about the question of a revision versus amendment, and then this argument that the Attorney General used on inalienable rights or something. That, but, but that was the technical question. And the courts went to great lengths 
to say we're not saying this is right or wrong we're just saying on the question on the issue of marriage they said on the issue of the technicality of a revision versus an amendment and the legal question the voters have the right to amend the Constitution just as they had the right to do the same uh, and the Supreme Court upheld it on the issue of the death penalty but some of us say well wait a second taking someone's rights away is it that easy to do with just 50% plus one? And what else could someone put on the ballot and change the Constitution? And that, to me, is a more perilous question. And what's the roles of the courts? Are the courts made irrelevant if we just keep changing not laws but constitutions all the time? And so that's a, an issue that I think ultimately needs to be addressed. And you heard Chief Justice Ron George in his Q&A at the court during the oral arguments really underscore this, say, well, don't you think that is really a larger question of the bar on amendments versus revisions. Maybe you should look at that question separately. And I think that's a path that they've led us to. Final point, they all but said, if you read this decision closely, they all but set the tone and tenor for a federal suit on the issue of civil unions and rights versus the word marriage. Uh, so I, I always, I, I had an instinct that the way this was going to be drafted would have been uh, done in a way that would sensibly help our cause ultimately. And my reading of this, and I'm lucky to be a son of a judge who spent 18 years in the California Court of Appeals, and he's, again, I just convinced him six months ago on the issue of this topic. He was not with me on this. Um, he has uh, read it, and he actually had his old clerk read it, and actually thinks I should be much more optimistic today than I was yesterday. Called me to say, hey, I saw you on the news. Um, keep your head up, because this is actually an opinion that will ultimately work to your favor. Uh, interesting point of view. Uh, I, of course, now want others to validate uh, his point of view, but it's, uh, I'm hearing more and more legal scholars say, hold on, uh, this is a very interesting decision, more so than it appears uh, on first reading. So is this U.S. District case right on point then, or? Well, what I, don't some, what it, I don't know the details Some have said that, that they're worried about the conservative nature of of, uh, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court and that. Um, but what about the conservative nature of the California Supreme Court? Remember, six out of seven judges were appointed by Republicans, the Chief Justice by Ronald Reagan himself. What about the Iowa Republican Supreme Court, though? The governor of Iowa, I saw Tom Vilsack, he said, I told you so. I said, what are you talking about, Tom? He goes, or it's now Mr. Secretary. I saw him last week, or two weeks ago, and uh, he appointed a number of those judges. But again, Massachusetts, Iowa, these are, tend to be more moderate to conservative courts. Uh, in some ways, they are the ones that have opened up this door. Massachusetts and the Goodrich decision did open up this door. Majority Republican appointees. So I'm not fearful of ideology. There's a reason. Remember, George Bush wanted to change the Constitution for a reason. He thought something was wrong in the Constitution. That's why he supported a constitutional amendment. I would argue, and these courts have argued, there's something right with the Constitution. It doesn't need to be changed. Well, now it does in California, but it doesn't federally because the Constitution doesn't allow us to discriminate against people, uh, not just on the basis of race or ethnicity or gender, but also sexual orientation. So uh, I think it's suggestive that even with this court uh, that uh, things could uh, play out differently than some expect. Final point, I also think it's an interesting bookmark in history if we look back to yesterday, the same day a nominee to the Supreme Court was advanced. We had this California Supreme Court decision, and who knows? She may pay a – who knows? I don't know this play a pivotal, a pivotal role uh, in this debate, because it ultimately will end up, I think, on her lap and her colleagues' lap uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court. Would you support changing the amendment process in California, and when would be the best time? Well, as you know, I've been for this Constitutional Convention for over a year. I think we have to dramatically look at the, uh, the, 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 the larger issue um, of uh, entitlements and initiatives, et cetera, in this state. I think the governor every day increasingly is all but said, he, you know, he's 100% supportive of opening this thing up because the limitations uh, and the uh, obligations that are advanced uh, have consequences years and years later that were unintended. I mean, remember Prop 13, uh, Howard Jarvis said this will not impact school funding. Said that. I mean, it's reasonably comedic, right, now to look back, but through that initiative. Um, you know, I, I just say it as an aside. You read the campaign literature of a lot of the initiatives, and then you look back and go, my gosh, were we off by a factor of infinity? 
Uh, and then it uh, begs the question, at what point is there recourse or is there ever recourse? And so I do think that the idea of a larger constitutional convention is long overdue and I think this could be part of the debate, needs to be part of the debate. What's a revision? What constitutes a revision versus what constitutes an amendment? Is taking someone's rights away, does that constitute a revision uh, as opposed to an amendment? The court says it's just an amendment, but some would argue it requires a revision. Interesting questions. I think that, again, this is why this, this narrative, this storyline is hardly complete, uh, even regardless of what happens next year in the ballot box. And it seems inevitable that there's going to be an initiative in 2010. Uh, no doubt about that. So you're saying you swayed your dad? He was opposed to oh, yeah, same-sex uh, marriage? Oh, yeah. He now? was uh, quoted. I was stunned at the at Placer County Jefferson Jackson dinner. Uh, I had always, I'd never assumed, but we talked around it for years. And... Uh, and, uh, and a reporter asked him in the Sacramento Bee, point blank, he said, about six months ago, my position was swayed. And he said, I always supported civil unions. You're, my dad's a sort of well-known progressive judge. He was considered an activist judge in his areas in the court. That's where I get a little bit more of my politics. Uh, so by no means a conservative, but a Catholic from the old school. And just said civil unions, same legal protections, uh, but not the word. And it took him some time to come around, and he ultimately uh, said, I've, I've now come around on this. And I wouldn't call my father a bigot. I wouldn't call him uh, homophobic. Quite the contrary. And this is a guy who taught me to be an advocate for people. Uh, and, uh, but he just was fixated on the word. And again, it's just generational. And it was so difficult for him. And so many of his friends, it's the same thing. And so I know how difficult it is for people on this. And that's why I think we're very wrong to cast aspersions on people that disagree. Now, people that totally disagree with any fundamental relationship between the gay community, then I think that's open to some critique. But people that believe that equality is advanced by another name, um, I don't think that's something that we should quickly take cheap shots. The President of the United States supports that point of view. Um, and, uh, and I don't think people are calling him homophobic or racist uh, or a bigot. Uh, and I think it's wrong for us to do that to our neighbors. I think we have to be careful. I think he just started the, the human side of this. You know, one of the, the biggest factors, I'll tell you, the, the reason I never understood that is he, he, he was very concerned in 2004, and then I walked him through uh, City Hall, and he all but had a tear in his eyes, and he quickly ran outside. He got it. And so immediately said, look, I get this, and I'm supportive. But he, I guess what he meant by that is I'm supportive of unions, Civil unions. I never really took it to the next direction until I read, and literally, Nat, I read that in the paper the next day. I said I was stunned. It was a, it's a really wonderful article I, um, for me, maybe not for anyone else, uh, but it was a few months back in the Sacramento Bee. On a different topic, have you read Harvey Rose's report this morning on muni? No. no. All right. Thank you all.